Good day and uh, hello. It's been a couple of weeks um, since we had an opportunity to be together in this format through a video and online. And I'm so grateful for you. I'm thank you for listening and joining and keeping and keep bringing me into your places. Uh, this past uh, week or weekend, um, I had a chance to go away and visit some family. Um, a couple hours away south of where I live now and it was good to spend what well, a uh, family day weekend with some family and have a have a have a bit of a rest uh, from ministry but here I am we're back in the saddle so to speak and I'm so so happy to be here too uh, to be able to bring and hopefully bring a, a uplifting and and a message to you from God I want to begin by talking about adoption. And uh, I'm not sure where you're listening to this from. If you're in Canada, you might have heard of the Adoption Council of Canada. And I went there to get some information. I'm not quite sure if these stats I'm about to share with you are accurate or up to date, but uh, I'll share them nonetheless so to get us moving along on this top topic of adoption. So the Adoption Council of Canada, there were some stats there. And it seems that there are about 76,000 Canadian children, and I don't know if it's currently, but Canadian children living in some form of public care other than their own homes. And about 22,000 of these children are legally eligible for adoption. And according to what I read, uh, about annually about 1,700 children are adopted each year. And there's an organization here in Canada called Focus on the Family, Canada. It is a Christian organization. And one of the things that they do is promote adoption. And you can go to their website, Focus on, Family, Focus on the Family Canada, and you'll find guidance and resources for those interested in adoption. And I came across one of their articles about adoption called Adoption in Canada, What You Need to Know. Now, I'm going to share some of those uh, points in that article with you. It's, this is not comprehensive. Uh, I just want to sort of just talk about the three ways that uh, Canadians can adopt. There's the public, private, and international. Concerning public adoption, this involves adopting children who are in the care of, of a provincial child welfare authority. And these are children whose parents are unable to care and parent them for a variety of different reasons. And therefore the court has turned, them over, turned over the responsibility for their care to the province. And children in, uh, in the public adoption can range anywhere from newborns to teenagers. And if one would go through that process to adopt someone through the public system, there would be no fees charged. Well, the second way in the article is, that was mentioned is private adoption. And private adoptions, like public adoptions, are governed by the province that you live in. And this type of ado adoption involves children who are being placed by a birth family. According to the article, usually but not always, uh, these are infants who are given up for adoption at birth. And there are adoption agencies which are licensed and, and accountable to the province, no doubt, that facilitate these adoptions. And these private adoptions are, um, uh, would have a fee associated with it from these agencies. And thirdly, there's the international adoption uh, opportunity. Now, international adoption regulations, of course, would vary between countries. So it'd be important uh, to go to your local provincial agencies to find the source of information and what countries are currently having programs of adoption and what's required. And then when all the legal paperwork is done, and who knows how long that takes, care, I'm not sure about that, Arrangements can be made for the family to receive the child. And usually this means a trip to the country where the child was, is currently residing in. And this uh, travel piece, uh, from the information I read, would be one of the largest uh, um, components of the fees involved in international adoption. And some of the numbers I saw, uh, these are probably not accurate, but anyways, I'll throw them out at you. Um, 15,000 to 40,000 Canadian to go and uh, pick up your adopted child, wherever this may be in the world. Now I want to turn to uh, the first century and back to the Apostle Paul, uh, to the Galatian Christians, which we're talking about in this sermon series, Galatians for Freedom. 
And Paul said to them, But when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his Son, born of woman, born under the law, to redeem those who were under the law so that we might receive adoption as sons. And that's in chapter 4, verse 4 to 5. So please turn in your Bibles to Galatians chapter 4. And we're going to be working specifically, we're going to be going through specifically working. Sounds like a hard job, right? Working through verse 1 to 7. But I want to back up to get some context. Maybe you, uh, maybe you uh, can even go further when you study this uh, on your own. So starting in chapter 3, verse 23, we'll read through the chapter 4, verse 7. Verse 23, chapter 3, uh, chapter 3, verse 23. Now before faith came, we were held captive under the law, imprisoned until the coming faith would be revealed. So then the law was our guardian until Christ came in order that we might be justified by faith. But now that faith has come, we are no longer under a guardian. For in Christ Jesus, you are all sons of God through faith. For as many as you, as many as you, at, for, pardon me, verse 27, for as many of you as were baptized into Christ have put on Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek, there is neither slave nor free, there is, neither, there is no male and female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. And if you are Christ, then you are Abraham's offspring, heirs according to the promise. Chapter 4, verse, chapter four, verse 1. I mean that the heir, as long as he is a child, is no different from a slave, though he is the owner of everything. But he is under guardians and managers until the date set by his father. In the same way, we also, when we were children, were enslaved to the elementary principles of the world. But when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his son, born of woman, born under the law, to redeem those who were under the law, so that we might receive adoption as sons. Verse 6, And because you are sons, God has sent the spirit of his son into our hearts, crying, Abba, Father. So you are no longer a slave, but a son, and if a son, then an heir through God. The Lord bless the reading of his word. Let us pray. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for this time to be able to read your word publicly and, and put it on a video for all to hear. I thank you, Lord, for that privilege that we have, and we should not take that lightly. I thank you, Lord, for the message that we're going to uh, hear from the Word. I pray, God, that you would, uh, by your Spirit, uh, inform our minds and touch our hearts and mold us and shape us to become like your Son, Jesus. Thank you so much for, for your Son, Jesus. Thank you for all that he has done for us on the cross. And thank you that you have sent his Spirit into our lives, into our hearts. We praise you and want to give you all the glory in Jesus' name. Amen. So we're picking up today uh, where uh, Pastor David would have preached last week uh, in chapter 3 to the very end in uh, verse 29. And here Paul, without skipping a beat, continues his exhortation concerning the standing of the Jewish and Gentile Christians in Galatia in relation to God. Paul had said in chapter 3 that those who are in Christ Jesus are all sons of God through faith. That's verse 26 in chapter 3. That the Galatian Christians who were baptized into Christ had all put on Christ. It's like you put on a coat, a winter coat, in the middle of winter. You put that on. They had all put on Christ. That's verse 27 in chapter 3. We also remember the whole point of this letter was that false teachers in one sense had bewitched and beguiled, pulled the wool over the Galatian believers I, so to speak, by teaching that observance to the Mosaic, observance of the Mosaic law was necessary to live a godly life before a holy and just God. So Paul at this juncture in his letter had up to this time provided plenty of biblical evidence that the Mosaic law had its holy and good purposes in God's plan of redemption and continues to do so in many ways today under the new covenant Yet the spiritual reality was that the law had held 
all in captivity, had imprisoned all, you find that in the 23rd verse of chapter 3, and held them all in prison until God sent his son. The Galatian believers, as we just heard when we read the text, whether they were Jew or Greek, slave or free, male or female, were all one in Christ Jesus. Paul makes the same point further on in his letter in chapter 5, verse 1, where Paul said there, for freedom Christ has set us free. So no, it's no wonder that Paul would uh, say with emotive language to the Galatians tempted to accept the reasoning and the teaching of the false teachers, the Judaizers, and Paul would say, I am astonished that you are so quickly deserting him who called you in the grace of Christ and are turning to a different gospel. So as we move now into verse 4, 1 through to 7, what Paul is doing here, he's clarifying his previous statements. And uh, I wanted to ask the question, why? Why does Paul feel it necessary to clarify what he said to this point? And we should know why, because the Judaizers would have presented their case by reasoning from the Bible, from the Old Testament. We see there in the Old Testament, the Jews had a relationship with God through the Mosaic Law. There are several instances in the Old Testament you will find that God himself called Israel the, his own precious and treasured possession. So one can reason and understand that the Jews overall did not see the Mosaic law as imprisonment or slavery or captivity as Paul had stated. For they had been brought out of captivity, as you remember the story of Exodus. So Paul here clarifies these statements concerning a law in what would be probably a positive light. We could say it that way with an illustration from his context, his first century culture. And we see here in verse 1 and 2 that he describes a household of a well-to-do male child. A male child heir who until coming of age was in many ways treated like a first century slave. Or like is the key word there, treated like. He wasn't a first century slave, even though, as Paul said, he is the owner of everything. And this young male heir would come under the supervision of what Paul is calling guardians and managers in verse 2. So in well-to-do Roman homes, it was not unusual that the children of the household would come under the care, the management, the guardianship of household slaves, given the responsibility by the father of the household, and the authority to educate and discipline their charges. And the young male heirs, would remain under their care until, Paul said, the time set by his father. And then he would no longer be treated like a slave, for he had come of age and would have access to all the rights and privileges of his father. So keeping this in mind, Paul now turns the corner at verse 3, and let's read that together. Verse 3, In the same way we also, when we were children, were enslaved to the elementary principles of the world. So what was Paul getting to here? What was Paul getting to? Well, we need to, let's go to another letter of his in Colossians. They're writing to the church to call us, Paul said this in chapter 2, verse 8. Paul said, See to it that no one takes you captive by philosophy and empty deceit. According to human tradition, according to elementary principles of the world, and not according to Christ. One thing you need to know about Christ, and you've probably heard me say this before, that Paul has a high Christological view. Nevertheless, this is what he said in Colossians 2.8. And so here's the point. The Mosaic Law is, in a sense, was, in a sense, acting like guardians and managers in the household. And in this manner, the Jewish Christians were no different than the Gentile Christians. And they aren't no different. We aren't. Christians are Christians. At the time, all are held, all were held captive and imprisoned, according to verse chapter 3, verse 23, enslaved by the law until Christ came. 
And this term, when we look at uh, these, this verse, elementary principles, according to, uh, the, according to BDAG, that is a Greek-English lexicon, means a couple of things. But because of the context, I'm using applying this meaning of things that constitute foundation of learning. And remember, again, keeping with the context, that Paul is using this term, the law can be seen as the ABCs, as one commentator put it, of God's revelation of himself. We can go to the writer of Hebrews at chapter 5, verse 11 to 14, and that will help us a little bit there. Hebrews at chapter 5 is speaking of maturity in Christ. So when we first begin our journey with Jesus, God in his grace feeds us with milk, spiritually speaking, of course. We all need milk, not solid food, when we start our walk with Christ. And the Holy Spirit teaching us the ABCs, or as Hebrews 5.12 put it, puts it, the basic principles of the oracles of God. And like the male heir in the Roman household, the guardians and managers, and in this sense, in this context, the Mosaic Law teaches the heirs the ABCs of the household. But of course, the expectation is that a child will grow up and take their rightful place and take the possession of their inheritance. And for a Christian, in the same way, we should grow up and then begin to consume what the Bible calls solid food, which Hebrew 5 tells us is for the mature. Here's the point. The law provides the ABCs of God's self-revelation, but all this changed when the promise given to Abraham was fulfilled when, according to chapter 3 again, verse 24, Christ came in order that we might be justified by faith. There's no longer a need for a Christian back in the first century up till today and moving forward to be under the supervision of a guardian. Why? Again, chapter 3, verse 26, For in Christ Jesus you are all sons of God through faith, not by works. Well, let's move on to verse 4, and we see here it begins with a conjunction, but. It's a conjunction. This conjunction then introduces new information. Information that is re in response to the circumstances described from verse 1 to 3 in chapter 4, but I would even bump it up further. The question is, what circumstances? Well, the Galatian Christians, Jew and Gentile, were at one time as we heard already, enslaved, held in bondage to the principles of the world. In other words, they had marched to a drum, the drumbeat of the culture. In thought, word, and deed, they marched left, right, left to the philosophy and ideology of the day. But something changed. It's important for us to realize that verse 4 to 5, in the very fewest of words, speaks and points to God acting in history. It was God, God alone, according to his promise to Abraham, who acted in history. Paul includes here in his letter what was most likely an early confessional statement used in the early church. And why don't we read this together in a confessional way? Verse 4 and 5. But when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his son, born of woman, born under the law, to redeem those who were under the law so that we might receive adoption as sons. So let's press pause for a second. And let me ask you this question. Have you ever taken the opportunity and the time to study God's redemptive plan and purposes as it is traced through the Bible from Genesis to Revelation? Because it's right there. And you would see that when God sent his son, it was not some whimsical, spur-of-the-moment act of God. God the Father wasn't sitting up there somewhere wondering what to do. The Bible is clear. If you are a Christian, you are a Christian because God acted in history. He acted always in the fullness of time, as Paul said here in verse 4. 
And the Bible paints this marvelous tapestry, this marvelous picture of God acting through human history to fulfill his purposes. And what was his purpose then in sending forth his son who was born of woman, born under law according to verse 4? Well, let's go to the, Paul's letter to the Ephesian for the answer. And Paul said it this way in Ephesians 1, 4, and 5. The purpose of sending forth his son is this. In love he predestined us for adoption to himself as sons through Jesus Christ according to the purpose of his will. And Paul goes on in Ephesians chapter 1 and said, In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses, our sins, according to the riches of his grace, which he lavished upon us. That's verse 7 and 8, chapter 1. Friends, the Bible tells us that God made known to us the mystery of his will, according to his purpose, which he set forth in Christ as a plan for the fullness of time to unite all things in him, things in heaven and things on earth. That's 9 and 10 of Ephesians chapter 1. And you read in Colossians also that it's through Christ that all things were made, all things were created for him, for Christ. Folks, God purposed to send his son so those who believe in his son will be redeemed. Verse 5, nothing that we did, everything that God did. We see a wonderful story, if you'll permit me to share, from Luke chapter 2. <clears throat> Pardon me, I just need a drink. And we see in chapter 2 that after the birth of Jesus, Joseph and Mary uh, went at the prescribed time to the temple for their purification according to the law. And there, there's a man called Simeon there in the temple. And Luke chapter 2 describes Simeon in this way. Simeon was a righteous and devout, waiting for the consolation of Israel, and the Holy Spirit was upon him. Luke chapter 2, verse 25 to 35. Now I want you to listen to how kind and good God was to Simeon. Luke tells us that God, by his Holy Spirit, revealed to Simeon that he would not see death before he had, been, he had seen the Lord's Christ. That's Luke 2, 26. And Joseph and Mary gave uh, the child Jesus to Simeon, who took him in his arms, and Simeon said this, My eyes have seen your salvation that you have prepared in the presence of all peoples, a light for revelation to the Gentiles and from glory to your people Israel. Luke 2, 30 to 32. My friends, the Galatian Christians, like Simeon, had been the recipients of God's direct action in history. And by the way, so have you and me. Recipients of God's kindness and goodness when they believed in his one and only Son. And Paul, in his letter, is consistently and purposely bringing them back to that time and place when they heard the gospel painted as a wondrous, merciful act of God through his Son, for it tells us in verse 4, to redeem those who are under the law. Praise be to God. But can I ask, what about us today? What about you? Have you forgotten the moment when God's kindness and goodness was revealed through his one and only Son. Have we all forgotten that moment when God gave us the grace of faith to believe in Jesus? Have we forgotten God's kindness and goodness that brought us to repentance? How our hearts were broken before a holy and just God. Our sin shown for what it was, an offensive and rebellious heart, deserving, indeed deserving the wrath and judgment of a holy and just God something that nobody even cares about anymore, it seems. Yet when we repented and believed in Jesus Christ as our Savior and our Lord, God gave us his Holy Spirit so that he would be with us always and we with him always. You know, I was reminded of a song by Phil Wickham called This is Amazing Grace when pondering 4 and 5, verse 4 and 5. 
And then the song goes something like this. I'll just share a few of the words. This is amazing grace. This is unfailing love that you would take my place, that you would bear my cross, you lay down your life, that I would be set free. My friends, that's truly amazing. Yet there's so much more in these passages. I want you to notice another verb in verse 5, receive. Redeemed is a verb in verse 5. Now receive is another verb here in verse 5. How it should humble us, how so humbling it should be to know that God initiated and acted in history so that we could be redeemed. But I want you to ponder this. God did this. Why? So that we might receive adoptions as sons. Verse 5. This word adoption is a legal term. We look at the first century. Roman law defined adoption. It was used throughout the empire. When a son was adopted, he was in all legal respects equal with those born into the family. He would receive the same name, the same position, the same rights and privileges, the same inheritance as the natural born sons of the family. Listen carefully, folks. God the Father sent his one and only son so that you and me, who by our nature are not children of God, might receive adoptions as sons. Verse 5. And before I do any ask, yes, sons include daughters. But here's the point. We find it in verse 6. Because you are sons, God has sent the spirit of his son into our hearts, crying, Abba, Father. Do you know what this means? Well, it means what verse 7 said. You are no longer a slave, but a son. And if a son, then an heir through God. Do you know what that means? If you have been redeemed, you have the same name, the same position, the same rights and privileges, the same inheritance. And as the IVP New Testament commentary puts it, as the one who is the son of God by virtue of his divine nature. Paul puts it this way in his Roman letter, Chapter 8, verse 15 to 16, Paul said, For you did not receive the spirit of slavery to fall back in fear, but you have received the spirit of adoptions as sons, by whom we cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. Think about that as you go from this moment. Well, Marshall Seagal, in one of his articles, leaves us with three things to remember as children of God, or as I would like to call it, children of grace. One, when God redeems, he secures forever. God the Father never forgets his children. You are safe from the unimaginable horrors to come one day on Judgment Day. My friends, Jesus Christ has defeated death for you, and he will deliver you to himself safely. Two, you are known and you are loved. Jesus, when he prayed, said, Abba, Father. This word, Abba, is a term of endearment from a child to their father. God the Father gave us the spirit of his son to be with us always, and we with him always. We can, with confidence in prayer, say, Abba, Father. My friends, we have a Father who loves us continually, always, deeply, always, personally, always. Even when we flub it all up. Thirdly, with Jesus, we become heir of all things. My friends, this is true, genuine prosperity. Not that fading prosperity that will all be burnt up at the end of time by the false peddlers of our days, the false teachers and prophets of our days. We can't even imagine it, but one day we will own it all. We will own it all. And the greatest treasure of all is not what God can give us, according to this article, but God himself. So, children of grace... You have one, security, two, intimacy, and three, true.
true prosperity. Let us pray. Lord, thank you. Thank you that you have redeemed us from that old, old way of life. Thank you, Lord, for the forgiveness of sins. Thank you, Lord, for the shedding of blood on the cross for the forgiveness of sins. Thank you, Lord, that you have redeemed us. We walked out of that prison never to go back there again. Thank you, Lord, that we are secure in you, that we have you, Lord, our Father, who cares uh, about us so deeply, who loves us so deeply, who is with us each and every day of our lives. And thank you, Lord, that one day we will fully realize what that means. We thank you, Lord, for that and praise you. And I pray for those who are hearing and watching this video. I pray, God, that you would bless them from the top of their heads to the bottom of their feet. I pray, God, for those who are listening and pay to this message and have not decided upon Jesus. I pray, God, that you would grant them repentance and salvation, that they would turn their lives over to you, O Lord Jesus. Thank you, Lord, for all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you so much again for having me in your places. God bless. Shalom.